Here are 10 disastrous mistakes that you can easily avoid if you apply the simple information in this video. So make sure you watch to the end. The first one is to do with TV licensing. If you are watching or recording live TV or even using BBC iPlayer on any device in your household, then you need a TV license. Otherwise you're committing an offense. But the only way that they could prove that you are doing this is to have some kind of evidence. The only way they're going to get that evidence is by coming into your property. There's only two ways they can come into your property. That is either because you invited them in or because they have a search warrant to do so. Obviously, if they have a search warrant, then you would be committing a further offence by obstructing that warrant. But I'm talking about the situation where there is no search warrant in place, but you get an agent visit and they simply ask you whether they can come into the property. So the first mistake on my list is allowing an agent into your property when they have no warrant or authority to do so. When the only thing they are going to seek to do is to find evidence with which they are going to try to convict you of this offence. So remember, if they don't have a warrant, they have no authority to enter your property and you have no obligation to let them in. Neither do you have any obligation to speak to them unless they have a warrant. So my suggestion in this situation is check first that they don't have a warrant and even if they do you're allowed to inspect it, read it and make sure that it's authentic. But if they don't have a warrant don't make this mistake of allowing a TV licensing officer into your property because all they're going to do is look for evidence that they are then going to try to use to convict you of this offence. The second mistake on my list is surprisingly prevalent and lots and lots of people do this and that is paying someone money without having a contract in place. I have lots and lots of cases come to me, not just for hundreds of pounds, but for many tens or even hundreds of thousands of pounds that people have paid across to a builder, a company, or even friends and colleagues and associates without having a contract in place. If you don't have a contract in place and you are relying on the verbal agreement between you and the other party, it's going to be very difficult, if not impossible, to prove what the terms of that contract were. This might be as simple as a loan agreement where you've loaned somebody money and you're expecting it back. They may ultimately say that you gave them the money or that you only wanted a small amount of it back or even at their discretion. If there's no written terms as to what the agreement was, this is going to be difficult to prove. Equally, if you have a builder coming to do work on your house, think about what the building work is going to entail. They might be taking the roof off, they might be taking walls down. But all of this work is going to do a lot of damage to your property if it's not finished, because if it's not finished work, then it's damage to your property. You certainly wouldn't give somebody 20 or 30,000 pounds to damage your property. But if you don't have a contract in place and they only do half the work and you've given them the money already, then essentially you've given them money to damage your property. And it's going to be very difficult to prove exactly what they agreed to do without having a contract in place. So this mistake, I urge all of you watching, please, please do not ever give anybody money, certainly not large amounts of money, without having a fully drawn up contract, ideally by a lawyer, so that you know exactly what you are getting for the money, the timescales, the penalties, the obligations on the parties, so that it's not all left to guesswork for you to try to piece together for the court to make a judgment on later on. In a similar vein to making purchases, my next mistake for you to avoid is putting someone else's purchase in your name. This very often comes about because someone else may not be able to get the credit to buy, let's say, a car or even a house or something else, but you allow them to use your name to borrow the money, but then the item goes in their name. Essentially, you are putting the purchase in your name for somebody else. Because the ownership of that item is not necessarily with the person that stumped up the money. If it's in a person's name, but the finance is taken out by somebody else, then you may well struggle to get the money back in the event that they fail or refuse to pay you back. This is particularly prevalent in unmarried couples where they share finances and ultimately one agrees that the finance is going to go in their name for, let's say, the family car, but then the couple split up what happens to the car and what happens to the finance. If you don't have a written agreement in place, like I said in my second mistake, and you've put the finance in your name, which is my third mistake, this is a recipe for disaster. The next mistake on my list is when there's been a dispute and there's been a claim filed in court. Many people will simply ignore the claim. It's not a nice thing to have to deal with a claim against you, but ignoring it can make things far worse. For example, when a claim is served on you, you have a limited amount of time to either acknowledge the claim or file a defense for the claim. If you file the acknowledgement of service as it's known within 14 days, you get an additional 14 days within which to file a defense. 
but you must file a defence within that maximum of 28 days. If you fail to do so and you've simply ignored it, not only will the claimant be able to obtain a judgment against you without there even being a hearing, but it may be very difficult for you to then set that aside later, which then would give you a chance to defend it, because you'll need very good reasons to be able to set it aside, and ignoring it is not one of those reasons. If, for example, it was served at the wrong address, and it wasn't your last known address, and there's various other technicalities that mean you can set aside the judgment, you may stand a chance of defending it later. But in the ordinary course of things, if you simply ignore the claim against you, you're likely to end up with a judgment against you, which is often referred to as a CCJ, which is a county court judgment, which can make it more difficult to get credit. And indeed, there might be enforcement action against you, which might take the form of going to your employer to take a deduction from your earnings to pay it to the judgment creditor before your employer pays you. There might be a third party debt order against your bank if the claimant knows your bank details and then the court will order most likely the bank to pay that amount of money to the judgment creditor. If it's a large amount of money, you may even end up with a charging order against your property so the judgment creditor can secure the amount of money against your house. And in the worst scenarios, they can obtain an order for sale to force you to sell that house in order to settle the debt. All of which can hopefully be avoided if you simply avoid the mistake of ignoring the claim in the first place. The next huge mistake that we see clients make is when somebody takes penalty points on their driving license for a spouse, a friend, a family member, or even a colleague or associate. This is very much worse than just having the points on your license. This actually amounts to perverting the course of justice and can result in a significant prison sentence. Before long, it will not just be the points that you're worried about, but you may well be being prosecuted for perverting the course of justice and most likely appear in the Crown Court trying to defend yourself. So however desperate the situation might be, however desperate your spouse or friend or associate might be, even if it means they might be facing a disqualification, believe me, the disqualification for the period of time that they will suffer is far easier for them to endure than you facing the prospect of a conviction for perverting the course of justice. The next huge mistake that we see people make is to do with retail fraud, and this can come about in a number of different ways. One of the simplest forms that we see people do is switching price tags between two different products. In other words, switching a cheaper price tag on a more expensive product. It might well go through the till and you might try to argue that this was a genuine sale. But in fact, if you've done this deliberately to deceive the person at the checkout, this is a form of retail fraud. Similarly, some people think that it's easier if you're at arm's length ordering things online to return an older or damaged product in exchange for a new one. This is another form of retail fraud. It is not just an innocent process of returning something and hoping to get away with it. If the retailer decides to take action against you and can prove, let's say by way of serial number or something similar, that you've returned an older or defective product in place of a new one, Again, this amounts to retail fraud, and you may well be prosecuted for it. Sticking with the theme of dishonesty, for the next major mistake that we see people make, sees the county courts clogged up with insurers filing claims for fundamental dishonesty about the person insured. In other words, the person has lied to the insurance company, either about the circumstances in which they were insured, or about what they say in the event of a road traffic collision or other kind of claim on their insurance. This is in fact much worse than just having your insurance claim denied. In fact, if you end up with a fundamental dishonesty tag against your name by the insurer, you are very likely to be refused insurance in the future, meaning you will not be able to get house insurance or car insurance, which will obviously have an effect on your ability to drive because you are not permitted to drive a motor vehicle without, at a minimum, third-party insurance. If you are able to get insurance with a fundamental dishonesty tag against your name, it's likely to be much more expensive or because you were dishonest in the insurance claim or about what you told the insurer in the first place. So to avoid this mistake, please always be honest with your insurer, both when you're taking out the insurance policy and when you're making a claim or you've got a claim made against you. Whilst the rules have changed somewhat about what you are to disclose to your insurance company, broadly speaking, it's often limited to the questions that your company insurance asks you, you do need to be honest about answering those questions. Another form of fraud which doesn't seem like fraud to those people doing it is fraudulent chargebacks on a credit card or debit card or fraudulent bank recalls by way of direct debit guarantee. 
Simply put, if you owe the money to somebody else for something very specific and you recall the money under false pretenses, that is a form of civil fraud, if not criminal fraud, because you are obtaining money by some form of deception at the expense of another. One such example of this might be where you tell your card company that you didn't receive the product when in fact you did receive the product. If it can be proven that you did receive the product but you've obtained the money back from your credit card company, this is a form of civil fraud and there are likely to be very serious consequences. In the worst scenarios, you can find yourself on the CFAS database, which is an organization that prevents fraud. And if you find yourself on this database, in most circumstances, you will find all of your bank accounts will be canceled, all of your debit and credit cards will be canceled, all of your credit agreements might be terminated, and you will struggle to get any form of bank account, any form of card, any form of credit, and that includes things such as mobile phone credits, and essentially you'll find yourself in a position where you simply cannot function with electronic money. All because you took one small action that you thought at the time was going to be relatively painless and perhaps even you felt like you deserved the money. But ultimately, if you make a dishonest statement whilst recalling that money, such as claiming that you didn't receive the product when you did receive the product, you may well find yourself on this database. My ninth and tenth mistakes are somewhat catch-all scenarios. The ninth being never buy from a company without doing at least some research on the company first, particularly if you're going to spend a lot of money with this company. This goes back to one of my earlier mistakes that people make, i.e. not having a contract in place. An equally devastating mistake can be spending a lot of money with a company that you haven't realized is in massive financial debts or is simply a brand new company which might be here today and gone tomorrow. If you spend a lot of money with this company and it's simply not a trustworthy company and it's either got lots of debts or it's just a fly-by-night company, your money might well be gone just as quickly as the company was incorporated. So to avoid this mistake, it's very easy these days. Just do a few Google searches, look on all of the review websites such as Trustpilot and reviews and so on, and make sure you have some idea about the company before you part with any money. And the 10th major mistake that we see lots of people make is falling for scams. There are so many scams around these days, particularly with postal scams, which typically arrive to you by way of a text message telling you that there is a parcel that needs delivery but needs a few pounds to get it delivered. You might well think that I'm expecting a delivery, I will just pay the money and hope that it gets delivered. Little do you know that you're paying money to a scam company never to be seen again. It might only be two or three pounds to you, but if they do it hundreds and thousands of times over, obviously it's a profitable scam for the scammers, but you are falling victim, and even if it's only a few pounds, this is a mistake to avoid. Much bigger scams might see people parting with thousands of pounds. Typically, they might be a doorstep salesperson saying that they are taking a deposit, let's say to put up some solar panels or any other kind of work to your property, only never to be seen again. They disappear with your money and lo and behold, no work gets done. If you want to hear about many more scams that we frequently come across and how to avoid them, please check out this video here.